The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony, to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him to ask him, Who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but admitted. I am not the Christ. So they asked him, What are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, who are you, so we can give an answer to those who sent us? What do you have to say for yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet said, some Pharisees were also sent. They asked him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ? or Elijah, or the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize, the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. This happened in Bethany across the Jordan where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Good afternoon, everyone. We are celebrating a Gaudete Sunday, a Sunday of joy, and, and we're celebrating this joyfully in two different ways. First of all, because we're preparing for the Nativity of the Lord, but also as a spiritual family, because we have celebrated the first profession of three, three roses three roses this past Friday. So congratulations for our dear sisters. We rejoice for them. Profound thanksgiving for their fiats. And why rose? Rose has two meanings in the Bible. The first one is the spouse of Solomon, the king. It's the beauty of the church, the church ready to receive her bridegroom. But also, as the numbers have a symbol, a rabbinic symbolism, also the flowers have their symbolism. And the rose is the flower that symbolizes perfection. So it's a symbol of Christ. The rose is also means the union of the spouse with his spouse, the church with Christ. And we are close to this encounter in Christmas in Bethlehem when the church is running to encounter our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord speaks to us about a profound theme. That's the theme of joy. We listen to the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 71. I rejoice in the Lord with all my soul, and I've, I am filled with jubilee for my God. I rejoice in the Lord. In Luke, the response to a song we sang, Spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And also in the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, brothers and sisters, always live rejoicing. And so in the three readings before the gospel, we see this invitation, this word of rejoicing. Be but the word is not in the gospel. This word does not exist in the prologue of St. John, nor the first chapter of St. John. But there are other very important words that communicate the path to authentic joy. The first word that we hear four times is the word testimony. That's the joy of the church. The joy of a Christian is to testify to my joy, which is Jesus Christ. Also, we listen 
to the path of this testimony, which is conversion. St. John, who is explaining what to those who are asking him that it's not since the prophecy of Malachi at the conclusion of the minor prophets in the Old Testament, it wasn't Elijah, and so it wasn't the prophet that Moses prophesied in the conclusion of Deuteronomy. And we know he was preparing for the path for the Messiah. But who was St. John the Baptist? Imagine, like the religious brothers and sisters have to choose a Bible verse to explain their vocation. St. John received this word in his soul from the book of the prophet Isaiah, which is to fill, make straight the way of the Lord. He says that his vocation is to enflesh this voice crying out in the desert, which are all the nations. And St. John has this vocation to follow preparing his people for the coming of God. And that's the vocation of St. John. And the joy of his people is when we have hearts open, the grace of conversion. And so the path to the joy is the path of repentance. It's the path of reparation. It's the path to encounter confronting my sins in the merciful eyes of the Lord so that I could enter into the true freedom. And this is the cause of our joy, that we are reborn in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so in this time of Advent, the church also invites us, the entire church, to prepare us well in these last days and encountering the Lord in Bethlehem. And how? Through the celebration of the sacrament of confession. This rose candle, this a symbol of a heart open to the tenderness and mercy of God. It's the sacrament of confession, which is the path from darkness, a world of darkness, to a world of light, which is the principal image of the prologue of St. John. And we enter the light through the confession, which has four aspects. It's a clear confession, a concise confession, a contrite confession, and a complete confession. Clear, concise, contrite, and complete. It's important that we begin with the dimension of clarity, that sin is the obstacle between us and God. And we have to have an interior gaze that understands that sin offends God, that sin is a stain over humanity. And with this clarity, we need to ask for the interior light of the Holy Spirit so that we may make a, pr a mature preparation for confession. From time to time, we have to run to the confessional and very good. And as a priest, with all my heart, I receive every person in whatever situation they're found. But yes, if we have the possibility, we must prepare well. And we pray for the light of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit may illumine us so that we may recognize our faults, our sins. It's a light, it's a clear, luminous light that helps us to do a good confession. We also want to distinguish between venial sin and mortal sin. St. John says in his first letter that some sins are, cause our death, that is, sins against the commandments of God. And these are the mortal sins, the ones that when we commit mortal sin, the grace of our Lord dies in us because these are mortal sins. 
And so mortal sin is necessary to confess before receiving Holy Communion. In the penitential rite, the Church we receive, receives in the penitential rite in, in the Mass, we receive, the Church receives venial sins. But if we have mortal sin, we must go to confession and we ask forgiveness and receive absolution. We must begin with a clear confession. I have a need of the forgiveness of God, the mercy of God, and I ask for an illumination of the Holy Spirit so that I can prepare well for a confession. The second aspect is a concise confession, that is, we want to arrive at the sin. We can describe everything in the situation, but the most important thing is for the penitent is that we state what that sin is with that clarity. I can say, this is my sin and this is how it is. And you say it by name. And it already means that we have to name the vices, capital vices, that I can say that my principal sin is pride, arrogance, vanity, whatever it may be, but with a name, and we specify well what the name of the sin is. Why? Because when we have this clarity and we specify what the name of the sin is, at the moment of confessing the sin, there's a, a deliverance of the chain of that sin because we, by our freedom, we have cooperated with the Holy Spirit so that from within the Holy Spirit can deliver us from that attachment to sin, and we say it by name. And so with our authority, our baptismal authority, we are delivering ourselves by naming the sin. It also requires humility. When we describe by name what are the sins, it requires more humility. And that's wonderful, because this is the path of conversion. And we can say, Father, these are my sins. This sin, this sin, this sin, by name. Without much conversation, if it's possible. There are some moments where we have to describe the circumstance, and perhaps we don't understand well. We can ask the help of the priest and, and to help us arrive at this moment. But if it's possible, we want to be ready to name our sins so that we may be delivered by name for those sins. A clear confession and concise confession. The third aspect is a, a contrite confession that is with contrition. The word in Latin is compuxio corde. That is truly, I don't want to sin anymore. I know I'm a sinner, I know I'm weak, I have these difficulties, these problems, but perhaps I have these moments where I feel desperate, but in reality I don't want to sin anymore. And so this desire to arrive at the desire to follow the Lord, repentance, compuxio cordis, means that perhaps I arrive with tears in my eyes and that these tears may explain to me better than my words. And we have to, when we've done great grave sins against our state of life, we may reach the Lord with tears, if not physical tears, but spiritual tears. Forgive me, Lord. This contrition, interior contrition, which after naming the sin, the spiritual sins cleanse the interior house with this blessed holy water of tears. And how beautiful when we have repentance with spiritual tears. Like St. John Maria Vianney would describe that the most important thing before the forgiveness of the sin in the by the priesthood in the confessional, is a disposition to contrition of the penitent. The tears of Jesus and Mary encounter the tears of the penitent so that the soul may be pure and cleansed. 
This is a blessing, and we have to ask, Lord, give me this spirit, this contrite spirit, this spirit of contrition. The fourth aspect of a, a well-prepared confession is a complete confession. And what does it mean that we confess, we have a complete confession? Above all, that we have confessed all of our sins. But also it means that we have a spirit of penance and reparation. That is, when I leave the confessional, am I not only leaving singing Alleluia, which is necessary, and glory to God at this moment. Praise the Lord. It's a most beautiful moment. Like, Alleluia, I am a sinner. I am forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Alleluia. We also have to embrace the cross. And so we are leaving the confession. Alleluia, Lord. And now I'm going to carry my cross. And the Alleluia continues when we are embracing the cross. And what does the cross mean? The cross is my salvation. The cross is my truth. The cross means that that now today with your grace I will enter into a path of reparation. That the wounds I've done in the past, I will repair for those wounds with new choices. I will ask forgiveness from others. And I will trust in the power and the mercy of the Lord that will show me a new path. St. John Paul II says that conversion is the most concrete expression of the work of love and the presence of the mercy of the Lord in the world today. Conversion is the most concrete expression of the work of the love of God and the presence of mercy in the human world. Conversion is credibility of grace in my life. The changes are the signs of my witness, my testimony to the world. Like St. John the Baptist, the change is the profession of my faith by the power of the mercy of the Lord. The changes are that I am a new man and woman by the mercy of God. And so conversion is my public profession of faith. Jesus begins his mini public ministry with the words Metan repent and believe in the gospel. When we finish our confession, a complete confession includes above all the absolution of the priest, but also a penance. And the penance, we don't receive it to receive forgiveness. Penance is my sharing in, my cooperation in the work of restoration with Jesus, but in my, li my, my concrete life. And so the grace of the confessional goes out through a life that's different and converted so that the new world, and this means that my contrition, my confession is reaching its culmination when I am cooperating with the work of restoration. Brothers and sisters, this Sunday of Gaudete, of joy, invites us to prepare for the interior candle so that we may be a church without stain. But that we also may contemplate the perfection of love in the pierced heart of Jesus. Which is a rose of the, the perfection of the love of God. And so we want to receive his grace. And we want to prepare ourselves well to enter in the path of the Lord so that our joy may be a true joy, so that our celebration may be a celebration of the things of God and not superficial things, because we may arrive to Bethlehem 
with hearts open, pure, humble, open to the Lord with this interior compromise of walking a new path. Because we have gone to confession, we have done a clear, concise, contrite, and complete confession. We conclude with these words of our mother founders. Advent is a time of waiting to convert, to become witnesses of hope for the entire world. It's a time where we await with confidence the trust, the visit, with tr total trust, the visit of this God-made man to draw humanity close to divine life. It's a time of joyful waiting and expectant waiting for the coming of our salvation. And it is a personal and concrete salvation where each one of us may profess that I believe in the love of the Lord and the love, love has saved me. All for the heart of Jesus through the heart of Mary.